recognizing Saanich North and the Islands. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And I think that it's important to acknowledge that uh, my colleague from Oak Bay, Gordon Head, comes to this place with more time spent with spreadsheets showing painting a picture than perhaps all of us and maybe all legislators in this country combined. The numbers have been showing a picture from my colleague from Oak Bay, Gordon Head, that has created <coughs> the sense of urgency that you see here today. The, the desire for us to take just a few more months of time to take a look at this, to perhaps maybe review some of the things that my colleague and, and in fact, his uh, former colleagues, and maybe some of his current colleagues, but former colleagues in this field of climate change. What we're asking for here today is but a brief pause, a brief moment to take a breath in this place, to not rush headlong into insanity, but to maybe pause just for a few moments to take a look at some of the numbers that my colleague from Oak Bay Gordon Head has been trying to make sense of, that he's been trying to tell the people of this province, to the people of this country, the people of this world, exactly what we have and what we're being faced with. So it's tough to sit in this place. It's, it's tough to hear this message. This is not a happy message. This is not a message that you deliver with a big cake. Say, congratulations, you are about to make a decision that is going to take us uh, one step closer to uh, an extinction narrative that nobody wants to hear anything about. But that's the decision. And there's all sorts of really feebly crafted and in fact very dangerous narratives that are being spun out in order to distract from this. And, and there are, I know, you know, I, I hear some of them, I hear bits and pieces of them, that this is a more complex decision than the one that, in fact, we have to make today. And I, and I want to assure the members of this House that the complexity has been manufactured by humans. It's not really that complex. There are not really labor issues that we need to deal with in this. There is not really a jobs narrative that we need to deal with in this. There's, there's not really a vote counting or an urban-rural divide split narrative that we need to be dealing with. That is a construct. It's a construct of political science. It's not even science, it's pseudoscience. Political scientists have created those constructs. The only conversation that we should be having here today is one about making a decision or not making a decision about sending us one step closer to less biodiversity, a more dangerous world. We, we heard in question period here today big, big words being talked about in this place about safety. We need to make sure that we're safe. All British Columbians need to know that they're safe. Where, Madam Speaker, is that conversation in the context of climate change? It's nowhere to be found. We don't care if our children and our grandchildren are safe. That's, that is being spun under the rug in the discussion around labor. That's being spun under the, discu the discussion under the jobs narrative, which became very, very popular under the uh, former government. It grew in popularity. It grew in popularity around the former federal government. It's the one that I heard uh, Donald Trump talking about uh, this morning on the news. Jobs, jobs, jobs. What good are jobs going to do in a world that is in, uh, that you can't live on? You can't eat money. You can't eat jobs. And you can't grow food in a world that's hostile, has hostile to growing conditions. 
So, Madam Speaker, I want to do a little bit of correcting the record because yesterday in one of my speeches um, in the response to the uh, amendment or the motion that I moved yesterday, I attributed a quote that I heard to some chiefs from the Nicola Valley when, in fact, the quote that I heard came from a uh, Democrat uh, a presidential candidate or maybe a future presidential candidate for the Democrats, uh, Pete Buttigieg. Now, Pete Buttigieg is a 37-year-old, he's a millennial, will be the first millennial to run for president. He's, from, he's the mayor, eight-year mayor of South Bend, Indiana, came out, he's gay, came out during a, uh, a, uh, uh, his mayoral re-election. And the reason why that's a, a, an interesting fact, it shouldn't be an interesting fact, but the reason why it is an interesting fact is because he's a Democratic mayor in a red state in an industrial Midwest town in the middle of Trump country. In fact, in Mike Pence, the vice president's estate. So this is, this is a guy that, well, he's a pretty serious dude, for sure. He's a pretty cool guy. And I was watching a clip on one of the social media networks of uh, Pete on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. And um, some of the things that Pete was, was talking about, uh, maybe President Buttigieg at one time, one day, was talking about, were pretty uh, in line with the kinds of things that we're talking about today. So he was asked the question by, um, by Stephen Colbert. He was asked the question, he said, you know, you're a young man, Pete, why, why would you run now? Why not wait for a little bit of salt and pepper till you looked a little bit like Olson, or looked like the member from Saanich North in the Island. Sorry, <laughs> Madam Speaker. Uh, just wait a few years, and maybe you'll look a little bit more tired and uh, have a little bit uh, more cynicism in you. And he said, you know what? Look, the reality here is, he says, that I have more experience than the current president, and it's my generation that's going to be on the business end of climate change. It's my generation that's going to be on the business end of climate change, so why shouldn't I be here at this time? And it's not about how old you are. It says it's about what the office needs at the moment and what you bring to the table. And that's the same challenge that I think that we f are faced with here. He also pointed out that economically, the, the uh, millennials are the first generation that are going to make less than their parents' generation did. Now, what does that say about their parents' generation? I think it says a lot less about millennials than it does say about the parents and the grandparents. What it says is that there has been a pretty devastating uh, philosophical approach here to short uh, and, and just cleaving to short-term decision-making. The, the kind of discussions that have been going on in the, are still going on in this place, despite the fact that we don't want to, we don't want to think about it. We don't want to actually agree that that's what's been going on. He finishes that little bit by saying, "There is no, there, no one has more at stake right now than the young people. So why not elect the young people?" So why did I go through that? I go through that because he also he says in this. He gets asked a question at the very end of the interview. He talks about how, uh, or, or sorry, Colbert re references President Trump, and he says, President Trump's about to call a national emergency right now about the border wall, and he says, Pete, what do you think is a national, what, what would you consider a national emergency? And Pete Buttigieg says this, what I consider as a national emergency is the two incidences that happened 18 months apart in my town. One was a 1,000 year flood, and the other was for what we were told was a 500 year flood. And this is a quote, which means either I have preposterous statistical luck or we have a problem with climate change that's not just happening on the North Pole, it's happening in communities like mine, that is an emergency." End quote. 
And so why would I confuse that with chiefs from the Nicola, you might ask? Because we were standing on the side of their river, and they talked about the preposterous statistical luck that they have, where they also experienced back-to-back multi-generational floods in years, in consecutive years, devastating their community, shutting their community off, in order to get from the First Nation, the Lower Nicola Band, to Merritt took five hours because he had to drive all the way around. It's a five-minute drive, for those of you that know the geography. This devastated their community for weeks. So the reason why I got confused was because within the space of a week, I'd watched this video, and I'd met with chiefs, and they basically told me the same thing. One was in South Bend, Indiana. The other was in rural British Columbia. So those of us who are defending rural British Columbia, the defenders of rural British Columbia, need to open their eyes to the fact that this is happening in our own backyard in rural British Columbia. And we think that we need to deliver the people of rural British Columbia jobs, a jobs narrative. What we need to deliver the people of rural British Columbia is the same level of safety that we are purporting, that is being purported by this government through their decision on ride hailing and the, and the, the defense that we heard earlier today in question period. So, I'm glad that I was able to uh, correct the record on that, and I'm sorry to the chiefs uh, of, of the Nicola, the chief of the Nicola, um, and, that, uh, and, and I'm sure that he may not mind me, you know, mixing up him with a presidential candidate, but nonetheless, I want to point out that what we are hearing here is we're hearing from chiefs who have some of the most, they've done an incredible job of leadership, and another incredible leader down in the United States, a young man who's running for president at 37. I've seen no, I, I have, I've not seen anyone in this province with the kind of leadership qualities as I see of many of the chiefs, as they do more with less in their communities. And so I think that it's important as we look at the, the, the amendment that we have in front of us to ensure that we have the opportunity to be thoughtful in our processes here. And I've been quite happy with the processes that are undertaken in the committees where the multiple parties can get together and have this conversation, ask the questions, bring the experts in and ask them to provide us advice. It's still up to government to heed the advice. They may or they may not, but at least we can say that we've done the work. At least we can look the children in the eyes and say, yes, we've done the work. There's another aspect of this which I think I really, want to, I really want to highlight, and that is somehow we have allowed the oil, and gas uh, the oil and gas industry here to hijack the word industry. The two have become synonymous. They are not synonymous. And the reason why I know they're not synonymous is because I have industry in my writing that's not oil and gas that does brilliant work. In fact, I've been going on a tour of the businesses in my riding in Keating Business Park in the Sydney North Saanich Industrial Park. The combination of those two business parks generates about a billion dollars. And again, I want to emphasize the b billion, the B in the billion, because we, we hear that, that we need to do that from the oil and gas industry to emphasize what kind of impact that they're having. But there is a billion dollars worth of economic activity that is being generated uh, out of two business parks in my riding. We've got high tech, we've got, uh, we've got medium tech, we've got low tech, we've got clean tech, we've got every kind of company that you can think of. We've got companies that are making stuff out of plastics, we've got com and, and yes, I understand that that starts as a fossil fuel. We've got companies that are, 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 are making innovations in MRI machines. Absolutely. My riding isn't the only one that has industry. Thank you to the member from Cowichan Valley for reminding me of Pacific Energy Stoves and Live Edge, businesses that, an industry in, her, in, in the riding from in Cowichan Valley. And we look at the, at the ridings across this province and I'm sure that we can, ha we can have a discussion about the incredible businesses that are generating revenue there. Turn to you too. But I, I want to, I want to do everything I can. If we are going to fracture conversations here, 
good word, man. fracture. If we're going to fracture the conversation, then let's fracture the, the connection that's been made between industry and oil and gas, so that the two are just synonymous, meaning that we can actually have a conversation about industry in this province and it not be only in the context of oil and gas, because there's a level of absurdity uh, there. We've got manufacturing companies, design companies. We have critically important job creators, innovators, investors, entrepreneurs. These are people that create jobs, that are currently creating jobs in this province right now, that are doing the difficult, uh, are making the difficult decisions about whether they feed themselves or, feed or, or, or create the next opportunity for their employees to eat. And we know that as an entrepreneur, Entrepreneurs make decisions that sacrifice their own well-being but often in order to be able to support the families that they, uh, that they have hired. So what's so frustrating about this? In addition to not only have we allowed the oil and gas industry to hijack this, wor uh, this, these, this word industry, but those industries on the Saanich Peninsula have been asking the government for the last decade to help them out. So it doesn't matter what brand of government's been in place, they have ignored those industries. So when I was on municipal council, District of Central Saanich, those businesses came to us and they said, we need help from the provincial government in better transportation services, transit, to connect where people live to where people work. We need more affordable housing in, in the area. We need to be able to attain housing. And if they can't attain housing, then we need to be able to transport, get them transported out to here. And we need access to better skilled labor. Now, what's fascinating about this is that all levels of gov a government, it doesn't matter whether it be the former BC Liberals or the current BC NDP, have talked about better transit, have talked about better housing, and have talked about increasing investments in skilled labor. And yet, for years, a decade, those businesses on the Saanich Peninsula have been asking for the government's support to get access to those three things. And that those ple that the pleadings of those, of those companies have fallen on deaf ears. Why after a decade are they still asking for the same thing, the same three messages? I did a podcast with a friend of mine, John Jurisic. He's been leading that charge. We talked about how frustrating it's been that the same message be delivered over and over and over again and nobody do anything about it. Instead, what are we doing? Instead, we're up chasing LNG companies, chasing gas down well holes, chasing them all over the province in order to be able to land the big unicorn in this province. We got people who have invested in this province today asking for the support of their provincial government, asking for access to the resources that they need to be able to, 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 not, just, to not just get by, but to thrive to hire more people, to create more prosperity in this province. We got this, we got this you know, jobs government and anti-jobs government narrative that's been going on, us versus them, black versus white, good versus evil, you know, the ongoing, long-standing narrative of humanity, good versus evil in this place, split by this aisle that, walks, that goes right down this place. Not once. Have they had anybody come out and offer a solution to help them make their, their companies more prosperous? Not only have they been ignored, but it goes a step further than that. They've had further obstacles put in their way. They were hit with the uh, employer health tax. You know what? Thank you for doing what you've been doing. Thank you for helping us out. And now, by the way, guess what? We are going to do a, a giant tax shift. We're going to take the MSP, which nobody wants to pay and needs to be gone. It's regressive, crazy-making tax on, on people. Wouldn't call it a tax because the last government didn't do taxes. They did other things. But nonetheless, it was a tax. We're going to take that and we're going to shift it right onto, uh, onto businesses because it's a great place to hide this tax. We're going to call it employer's health tax. And by the way, you need to remain competitive by assuming that tax. That's what they got. That's the thanks that they got. That's fine. That's fine, but that's the thanks. That's, that's fine, but that's the thanks that they got. So that's the thanks that they got. 
It goes wor it's, it's worse than that, though, uh, member from, uh, member from uh, yeah, my friend. It's different than that. It's, it, goes, it goes further than that. Because not only did they get hit with the employer's health tax, but they were hit with increased corporate taxes. That happened. <coughs> they were not given the break on the PST that the LNG, uh, that the, the LNG golden child was given. Oh, oh, don't worry about it. You can, you can don't have, you just don't pay PST. Everyone else, you compete with this PST LNG golden child, big unicorn, no PST. Carbon tax, you don't like that? Don't worry about it, it's all good, we got you covered. What about We've, electricity? No worries. Electricity, hydro, no <coughs> worries. You know what, and, and you can play a bunch of mathematical games and stuff and that's fine too, we'll let that slide. The companies in my riding, not quite so lucky. They're covering on all of that. And you know, you know what makes me really just uncomfortable about this whole thing? Is that LNG, LNG Canada not only had the gall to say to give that list to British Columbia, but they said, we also want a break on tariffs of uh, aluminum and steel from the federal government, or else we're not gonna come. And, if, and we'll throw a little fit over here in the corner if you don't give it to us. So at a time when, when tariffs on steel and aluminum were being slapped all over the place, uh, and, and the, the, the prime minister of this country was in, was in, uh, was in DeFasco or Stelco out in, out in Hamilton with the steel workers all around him getting pats on the back saying, I'm standing up for you. At the same time, they were talking about, about letting uh, LNG Canada off the hook for aluminum and steel tariffs. And those companies that are manufacturing state-of-the-art products in my, in my uh, riding are telling me, you know what, you know what, those steel and aluminum tariffs, they're a real burden on us right now. And not in the, not, maybe not even in the way you think, but because aluminum and steel from Asia is not coming on the boat to the United States, it's costing us more to get it because we have to have special shipping to get it here. So it's, it's, it's hurting them in a bunch of different ways. So not only do we give them that whole tax break, the $6 billion that could be used to build housing, that could be used to build uh, uh, the, 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 the $6 billion of corporate welfare that we gave them to build housing and transit and to uh, uh, train more skilled labor. We're also saying to them, you're going to have to compete in a marketplace where you don't get the kind of steel and, ta and aluminum breaks that are golden ch that the golden boy. I almost want to do like a Ric Flair, Woo! but anyway, well, I just did. The golden boy gets. So compete away in a, in a marketplace that's tough and that we continue to make tougher. We're not going to help you out. We're not going to do what you, we, you want us to do, uh, but we are going to celebrate you. We are. We're going to celebrate you. We're going to celebrate the the Viking heirs of the world. We're, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna, when we need you, we'll do a, a ribbon cutting there. But, but really, we're gonna just allow this LNG, this, this massive uh, uh, project to be built by the partners in Asia and floated in chunks here. So every single Time, they come to the table and say, give us more, give us more, give us more. We say, we give you more, we give you, give you more, we give you more. And the people who've invested in this province are looking at it and going, what the... You fill in the blank. Freedom. I'm going to end with this. There's a, lot of, there's, a, there's a lot of misinformation about what the BC Green Caucus is anti this, anti that, against this, against that. It's, 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 it is uh, misdirection, it's misinformation, and it's wrong, because we are for the economy. I think I just demonstrated that we are for a strong, vibrant economy. We are also for a sane economy, a resilient, sustainable, diversified economy, a modern, agile, flexible economy. Not one that goes all in on grandpa's technology. 
my late grandpa. May he rest in peace. We are for social justice. Some will say, you don't support labor. You don't support social justice issues. You're Greens, you, you, you can't support those, because that's, there's another party that already does that. Well, I want to tell the people of British Columbia and to the people in this room, yes, we do. Yes, we do believe in social justice issues in this province. Yes, we do believe in protecting workers and making sure that we look after our people and that we do it with love and we do it with compassion and that we're empathetic. That is who we are. And yes, we are for healthy ecosystems, which is just absolutely insane to be even saying those words out loud. We like clean air. We really like clean water. We like plants and animals, and we like other humans. We like biodiversity. We take great pleasure in walking through healthy forests and standing on beaches that are not covered in plastic, we like those things, and we support them. We are a pretty balanced, thoughtful group here. This is not insanity that you're seeing coming out of us. We're not throwing a fit here because of some small, for some small reason. We are making statements here, and we're asking through this amendment to ensure that there is a thoughtful process in this and not that we just usher this thing through, that we don't just accept the 18, point, 18 page or whatever it is, PowerPoint presentation that sold us, the pitch that sold us this, that we actually take some time and think about it. As a wise in indigenous proverb said, we didn't inherit the earth from our parents. That's right, we are borrowing it from our children and our grandchildren. And so I want to come back to our children and our grandchildren. I want to come back to those kids that were standing on the front steps. I want to just say this. It's not right that the children, our children, are being turned into activists by the decisions that we make in this room. They should be in school learning, or in nature learning, as my daughter, my daughter often learns in nature, not in a classroom. They should be feeling that their learning matters. As I made comment in my, in my previous statements, it's a pretty sad state when, when our youth are like, meh. Whatever. I mean, I skipped school for a lot of reasons. Well, I, a couple reasons primarily. I didn't skip school because I didn't think my learning mattered. That's pretty sad. They should be able to trust their leaders are going to do what they said they're going to do. They should be able to trust us. They should be able to take the words in this place and recognize that, that there's some consistency from year to year, from session to session, from parliament to parliament. And I can say that on this issue, that's not been the experience of the members of the current government. So I want to just finish by acknowledging, as we wrap up our, our, our talking points, our talking on this issue, the work of our staff downstairs have done a tremendous job. We have a small team. They are a powerful team, Evan, Claire, all this for keeping us all here and in place, and the rest of the team, thank you, thank you, thank you for the work that you've done to prepare us to be able to come and stand in this place, to stand for the kids, to stand for British Columbia, and, for stand, and to stand for a future worth living in. Heichka, thank you.